exclusively to discuss Prudential PLC CEO Mike Wells. Mike, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. But very quickly, for those people that don't know, what's the difference compared to Prudential Financial here? Uh, quite a bit of difference. The, so our primary markets, our, our business here is Jackson National Life, which is a, an annuity retirement services business. And the bulk of our footprint is in 14 markets in Asia. And we started in the UK 170 years ago. I uh, have an asset manager there, M&G, and a, and a traditional very strong position in pensions and life there. And we're actually in the process of demerging that from the international businesses. And I'm here on a U.S. roadshow meeting with investors. And so after you've split off some of the, the U.K. Europe business, you're going to be half and half, a little bit more to Asia and to the U.S. Let's talk about the, the Asia business uh, first of all, because insurance doesn't often get seen as a high growth business, but in Asia it is. It is, yes. It is. Uh, Historic rates have been about 15 percent. In most markets in Asia, there's no government support for retirement income or health. So what you see is the consumers tend to self-insure by keeping a lot of money in cash. So it's an interesting area to do business. You have usually government support and sort of a tailwind to privatize some of that risk. Uh, we're one of the largest players in the region. We're in 14 markets there and uh, operating earnings up 14 percent in that, in that business uh, the first half of the year, and it continues to grow year on year very successfully. Have you seen impacts of the trade war, and has it shaken out differently across certain countries? It, it has. We're seen as a British firm, so, so the direct you know, impact on, a, on, a, on U.S. tensions has very little effect on us. I think you see it in Southeast Asia. You know, there's a, there's a narrative emerging that uh, I don't candidly agree with, but that a lot of pundits are saying that some of those countries are going to have to choose relationships and things, and they see sort of a binary outcome in it. Uh, I think there's some flaws in that logic and both from a historical point of view, and uh, they tend to compare it to the Cold War, mm -hmm. and there wasn't a whole lot of trade between the East and the West in the Cold War, and you know, the, these two markets, both these two countries both need each other and a lot of goods and services, so I think it's a... It's a, it's a poor comparison, but I, I meet a lot of leaders and policymakers who are worried about those sorts of tensions, but more in Southeast Asia. How about as it pertains to what's going on with Brexit in the UK and how that affects the relationships with the rest of the European countries in which you operate? So I've had the pleasure of being CEO from the start of Brexit, and uh, it's been an interesting experience to be on the ground for it. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, when you get that sort of wide mandate in the populace, uh, and marginal support. You know, you're seeing this now in governments around the world where you're elected and you're responsible for delivering something and you have a 51 percent uh, election or mandate. It's a very difficult thing to execute on. Um, you know, we've prepped our businesses for it. Uh, our U.K. businesses have uh, CCAVs in Luxembourg and they're very, very successful at raising money and in, in assets in Lux in, across Europe. So that was probably something we could have or should have done structurally anyway. Um, but it's you know, almost 30 million pounds, and, and you get it done quickly, and you make sure you're ready for the shape of whatever comes. But I, candidly, at this point, I wouldn't try to predict uh, even next week's uh, you know, news, let alone the outcome. Uh, European friends have varying emotional responses to it. Some think it's an interesting thing. Some think it's uh, disloyal. You, know, you get that whole range. It's got a lot of emotion around it. Uh, in the U.S. business, Jackson Life, uh, you sell a lot of retirement products we and do. annuities. Uh, are you seeing a structural shift away from annuities versus more kind of modern investment products, as it were? And similarly, uh, on the cyclical side, with yields so low, are they, in fact, getting a bit of a renaissance? So they're uh, the, uh, a bit of the latter. So you've had un uh, uncertainty with the Department of Labor and the SEC over what the sales practices should look like in the United States. What should be a commission trade? What should be a fee-based trade? And there's a little better line of sight on that now. If you had Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or one of the firms on, they would feel like they know what to do. Um, those firms' business models at the retail level are moving more and more towards uh, financial plans, often very sophisticated plans. The advantage of the products is you can stay in equities longer into your retirement. So that has a technical sort of tailwind to it. Um, but it's, it's, been a, um, you know, it's been an interesting year. There's been a lot of capital changes, things. Most of that's behind the business, and we're in very, obviously very well positioned for that. Just quickly want to snap back to the Asia business. A uh, significant amount of your sales is in Hong Kong. I, it I is. guess the, the protests always front and center have been for a number of months now. It kind of gives the image uh, that things are grinding to a halt. What's it like, though, for financial firms? I know it's not business as usual because there's a lot of challenges there, but are you still able to operate you know, the vast majority of your business? Yeah, so we're one of the largest life insurers in, in Hong Kong, and we also have a regional office there. And uh, the business that we write there is, uh, for consumers, is a, typically a savings product that they invest in every year, and they can choose to have additional resources go to education, go to health if they want access to doctors, uh, a variety of different things. So, it's almost a subscription-type business from an investor point of view. 
So a given year sales don't affect the earnings particularly because so much of the earnings come from the existing relationships with clients. But you are seeing uh, tensions. It's more, it doesn't change demand uh, locally. Demand is up locally and that part of the business is growing uh, uh, significantly. It changes a bit of the comfort level of people having traveling. So we get a, we, you know, we get a short term hit. But we've been there since 1960s. Mm -hmm. So you know, we've seen other disruptions in Hong Kong you know, as its you know, political environment develops. And, and it's true in other markets we're in around the world. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it tends to defer transactions. It doesn't tend to, to uh, stop people from saving for their children's education or retirement or whatever their objective is.